So I'm joined today by Tony Lenehan, uh, advocate and president of the Scottish Criminal Bar Association. Good morning, Tony. Good morning. Are you excited about the quiz? I am not. <laughs> thank you for asking. Well, I, I am. So I'm, I think it'll be great. So we'll just get started, Tony, um, with our first question, which is, if you weren't a lawyer, what would you be? Well, I, when, I, when you sent me the questions in advance, so people understand that that's how it works. And when I was thinking about that, I suppose the closest I had to being something else was law wasn't my first degree. My first degree was an engineering degree. Um, and I suppose I could have gone off. But, but I think what happened was when I went to university, I chose the wrong engineering specialty, mm -hmm. which was electronics, which I didn't find exciting. Whereas I think if I'd done mechanical or something like that, I would probably be doing that rather than this. Mm -hmm. Not that I regret but that's, that, I think that's the way it would have worked. So how long, how, how many years was your, your first degree then? Four years, not uh, an honours engineering degree. So you stuck with it even through honours? Yep. When did you realise you didn't, you weren't enjoying it? Um, I enjoyed being at university and I enjoyed some of the subjects. I had very good friends at university. But I, I think that I didn't really focus on life after university whilst I was there. Mm -hmm. So I went through the routine of exams the way I had at school. Um, and I think that probably in my last year, I will, you know, I, I wasn't even certain during my last year that I wasn't going to do that. Okay. Um, I, I, took, I took a year out after it. And during that year out, I... Uh, I decided that this wasn't for me, with some guidance from other people that it wasn't for me that I should do law. Okay. So was it during that year out that you decided to do law then? Well, that, that makes it a more folk, sound of more focused decision than it really was. Um, that it, it was a suggestion put to me by my dad and, um, and with their, my, the assistance of my parents, then that became a possibility. So I then did the two-year degree. Right. Okay, which uni did you go to, uni uh, Tony? Glasgow, both times. Right, okay. And you, did you then discover you enjoyed law? I discovered, well, so I went to do the two-year degree coming on the back of my finals year of engineering. And engineering is a quite a different discipline. So mm -hmm. what I found is I've got a reasonably good memory and it means that I can put myself in a position to pass exams in, in law, for example, quite quickly. Whereas in, in engineering, you, you can't bluff your way through the applied math side of it. Right. So I feel quite straightforward from that point of view. Um, and I did enjoy it. Although even then, I wasn't really sure that I understood. I hadn't had any work experience as a lawyer, so I didn't really understand the reality of what you would do as a lawyer. I'm not sure that university prepares you terribly well really for any career, mm. it, 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 it teaches you how to work and things like that. But uh, And then I sort of fell into a job in Paisley uh, through Mark Chambers. Remember Mark Chambers? Oh, I know Mark, yes. Yeah. So I don't think I was ever, you know, laser tracked towards a career in the law. It, things sort of happened that way. And that's and then once I was there, it, it, all, it, it all went fine. So all right. I, Okay, well, maybe come back to that. I don't know if that was your time in Paisley features later in your questions, but if they don't, um, I'll certainly bring you back to that because uh, I knew you when I was a fiscal in Paisley. Correct. You were a very difficult fiscal in Paisley. <laughs> so you say. <laughs> I probably was. Um, all right. <laughs> Question two, Tony, is did you have a nickname at school? If so, what was it? And why were you given it? Um. Really, from school onwards, I've been called Big T. I'm assuming because, you know, like a nice dinner at night. I don't know. <laughs> but, and so there's nothing, nothing more complicated than the fact that my name is Tony and I've always been very big. Okay. When I was at school, I was very, very tall, very, very, very early. So I, I think by... You know, primary seven, I was six feet tall. So I was a, a freakish giant. 
and then thankfully sort of slowed down later on. <laughs> I've always been big from that point of view. All right. Uh, question three, Tony, what was your first job? Well, I had to write down my list of jobs because I, I worked through both the latter days of school. I had Saturday jobs. And then at university, I had all sorts of jobs. So in chronological order, I worked in a garden centre, filling bags of pebbles and things like that and sand. Worked in a fishmonger's, which wasn't very pleasant. Um, I worked as a postman for a summer. Right. And I worked as a postman at a time when I had terrible hay fever, which I still have. But I also had weak veins in my nose, so I had nose bleeds all the time. And so this would be about 1987 or 8, and I was, was forever having to handwrite on the outside of envelopes an apology for the fact that it was all covered in drops of blood. And my suspicion is that probably wouldn't be, that wouldn't work nowadays, but at the time everyone seemed to be okay about that. <laughs> so as a postman, I worked in a fishing shop for many years, which is a job I absolutely loved, a shop called Kefaros in Glasgow. Uh, I worked in Tyso through university, for, that's during my law degree time. Um, I can't read my own writing. So that was so that university. I lived in a tent for a year. <laughs> I, I was I, I after my first degree, I went to uh, Yosemite Valley in Tuolumne Meadows, which is the sort of surrounding higher country in in uh, California. Because I was a big climber in those days. There was very much less of me in those days. I I, I was about. I think I was about eight stone lighter than I am just now. So I was very thin and very tall. Um, and then I, was, then I was a solicitor. I, I was a recognition agent at, at the same time I was a trainee for a while, and then solicitor and then advocate. Right. And was that at Todd Mitchell then? You were, you were a recognition agent through Mark? No, no, no. Todd Mitchell was the third firm. Uh, I trained with a, a very nice chap called Stuart Wilson, who did a sort of mixed civil practice. So family stuff, people falling down holes, dampness claims, things like that. Right. Then with my continuing friendship with Mark Chambers, he worked for uh, Care Chambers Lynch in Paisley. Okay. And I went across there initially to start a civil wing of their firm. They had a very busy criminal firm uh, and then sort of slid sideways into doing criminal work. I, I, I would work then in preparing a lot of the high court cases and uh, and then left there along with Mark Chambers and another chap to go to Todd Mitchell and then Todd Mitchell for the last, I think about four or five years before coming to the bar. Okay. And, and the civil side of it, what happened there? Were you, were you no use at that or were you just drawn more to the criminal side? I just, I, again, I suppose, slid in the direction of the criminal side when I was in Care Chambers Lynch, partly because I enjoyed it and partly because there was work that needed to be done in some cases and I quite enjoyed doing it. Um, the civil side, one of the advantages, I think, in criminal work is things come to a conclusion quite quickly. My experience, of particularly the fam family work, was cases never resolved, never ever. You would still get phone calls on a Monday morning about uh, problematic contact visits at the weekend and, 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 and it was clear in many cases they were never, you were never going to find a solution. Whereas crime, criminal work do, does have that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's a shorter trajectory uh, and I quite like that. Yeah. Sorry, that was very mean of me to say you were no use. Of course you were Used to it, you just didn't. It wasn't your forte, <laughs> or it wasn't what you fancied doing. Um, all right, well, wow, that's that's a long list of jobs. Um, okay, question four, Tony, is what do you recall of your first court uh, appearance? I don't remember my first civil court experience. Uh, I remember my first criminal one. Mm -hmm. In those days, you didn't have to be registered. Uh, on the criminal list to do criminal legal aid work. And so I think, I'm, I'm going to blame Mark Chambers for this, but I, I had a phone call or the, the, the man I was working for, Stuart Wilson, had a phone call to say that Mark Chambers needed somebody to go and do a trial 
and they had nobody else could I go and do it okay. and so I went to do it with l very limited criminal experience and I remember in, in front of Sheriff Spy do you remember Sheriff Spy? Yes uh -huh. um, he was quite a forbidding sheriff I think he may still be a sheriff in prison I think he's about to retire this year um, but he is still there currently as I understand well he was certainly forbidding in those days and I remember what I remember about it is when I put the accused in, it was maybe a road traffic case or something like that, and the Crown, the crown I don't know, I can't remember who the deputy was, the Crown started to ask him all sorts of questions that I hadn't asked him. And so I stood up to object to say to Sheriff Spy, this is not a matter that arose in Chief. If they wanted to raise this, they should have called him as their own witness. And I remember Sheriff Spy just sort of looking at me open mouthed for a bit in case he'd misheard and then just slowly shaking his head and then I sat down. And, and, and you know sometimes when you're speaking you realise, what am I saying? This is madness. <laughs> and so I realised that halfway through. So that was, uh, that. I suspect I will remember that appearance for a long time. Yeah. Oh. We all make mistakes, Tony. We all make mistakes and we learn from them. That's the main thing. Um, <clears throat> all right. Question number five is who is or was your most inspiring colleague? When I, when I started, uh, now, you mean at the bar? I suppose it makes sense for me to answer that in the context of the bar. Yeah. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do is duck out of giving you a single name because the difficulty with giving you a single name is I think it... It, it, it won't let it cause offence to others, but it, it perhaps gives prominence to somebody when, in fact, there are a number of people. So when I started off, like everybody else, I did a lot of junioring. Um, I juniored in some great cases, but the, the seniors with whom I worked most often, who impressed me and from whom I learned a great deal, would be, it, it, honestly, in no order, it would be Francis McMenamin, first of all, who's a genuinely, genuinely impressive human being. Uh, worked with Brian, I worked with Edgar and enjoyed Edgar's company enormously, enjoyed the company of all of them and Ian Duguid as well you know I still learn things from Ian Duguid every case that I do with him or every time I see him in court mm -hmm. so I think I would, if I'm allowed to have four people I think I would say those four but, I, but I've been inspired by many 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 people many people yeah I think people struggle with this question to, to hone it down to one so yeah I think uh, that's fair enough and uh, yeah, I agree with all your choices. Edgar features heavily in this quiz, but um, I haven't actually asked him if he would take part, but I'm doubting that he would. I don't think it's something he wants to come back. It would and, be good if he would, though. It, it would, really be. would be. I think, honestly, about 90% of people that take the quiz mention Edgar. Um, so maybe I will ask him and see if he'll, he'll come on. All right. Um, Question six, Tony, is how do you define success? Hmm. What I've written down for that is that if I, or if whatever it is you do, if on, by the Sunday night when you go to bed, you're not dreading getting up on the Monday morning, then I think you can say that you're successful in what you do. So I am very grateful for the fact that I, I don't get out of bed in the morning dreading coming to work. I look forward to it. I enjoy my working days. And so I think that's the, all the success that I could hope for in that. And, you know, anything else which looks like success matters less than the fact that I have an enjoyable, um, and, you know, obviously demanding for all of us, but an enjoyable working life. And that's very, very important to me. Okay. Very good. Good answer. Question number seven, favourite holiday destination? Well, I've got one that's far and one that's near. Um, so when, when I was, uh, before I was married, before I had, we had our son, uh, I travelled a lot through my fishing. So I fished in the, tro the tropical seas a lot. Okay. Um, and I think I would probably plump for probably the Florida Keys. It's very, very, very good fishing trips to the Florida Keys. And it's, it's a nice combination of a very wild um, marine environment, but also 
the sort of infrastructure which allows you to go and get a, a nice meal at night. Some of the places that I went to that were a lot wilder than that were okay in the context of a less demanding job. But when I, when I need some sort of recharging and relaxation from a holiday, I couldn't go back to, I mean, I went to South Andros in the, the Bahamas and South Andros is the only place in the world you, need, you couldn't buy a can of Coke there, for example. There, there was just nothing. There weren't shops. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I, I went to, to a fish in the, a bit later on in life, I went to fish in the Coral Sea. And so, so I was staying in a sort of mothership out in the Great Barrier Reef. And again, fantastically, extraordinarily wild marine environment, um, but quite hard going for, for a holiday and lots of traveling. As I get older, I can't be bothered with long haul flights as much as I used to. So my my for many years at Easter time, along with one or two friends, um, and occasionally Mark Chambers. I'm not saying that because he's not a friend, but simply because <laughs> he hasn't been. I, I tend to go c- camping with a small boat to a place on Harris. Uh, the, the, the end of a long fjord called Kinloch Resort, just means the head of Loch Resort, mm-hmm. which is a really fantastic spot and very, very remote. If you look at it on a map, it's about as remote a spot as you can get in Scotland, I think. And it has the advantage that you don't have to lug all your stuff by on your on your back in a rucksack because I can take the boat there. Mm-hmm. Just as, as a small boat you can pull up on the bank. But Kinloch Resort is uh, a place where you know, three days there is worth more in terms of relaxation than two weeks anywhere else. I quite like skiing as well. I came to skiing late in life. Mm-hmm. And an enormous fat lump is not ideal for skiing. But I enjoy skiing again because I've always enjoyed mountain environment. Uh, but I probably overall, if I never went back to Kinloch Resort, I would regret that more than any other destination. Okay. For, for its remoteness or its... It's a great. It's just a, a wonderful spot, and the, the remoteness is important. You know, there's your your. It's not just no cell phone. You're you're miles from anywhere where you could remotely have a chance of getting any cell phone reception. So you're completely cut off from the outside world. Right. You never see anybody there. Great wildlife, quite good fishing, great camping. I know you. Exp- I explain camping, and by and large, lady advocates look at you as if you're mad. Because why would you ever go camping? Yeah. Camping's good. More people should go camping, I think. So, mm. you used to ski, or you perhaps still ski? Is that right? Uh, I used to ski. Yeah, I guess I was going to ask you about the skiing. Um, have you been out in the snow, which is very good at the moment for for skiing? Um, I haven't. There's no. There's nowhere. I would have to go ski touring, I suppose. Um, and there's nowhere that's local. I mean, I suppose the camps is behind me, but it'd be a lot of hard work. So, no, I haven't done any. <laughs> what I tend to do is go skiing for one week. The first week in first full week in January each year, mm-hmm. we would go to the somewhere, um, and that would go very well. But last January, when I went, about forty minutes after I put my ski boots on, I broke my shoulder. I don't think we'll get skiing this year. Although I would have been keen to go back skiing. You, you I mean you would know? I, I, I'm forever breaking bones and all that sort of thing. So I'm not put off by that. No, good, but, good stuff. Yeah. All right, question number eight, Tony, is which is your, or was your most memorable case? I think my most memorable case would have been a terrible case, which was the Queen's Park murder. Mm. Um, Now, I, I, oddly enough, I'm not great at looking back along a timeline and telling you when that was. It feels like it was maybe eight or nine years ago, it might turn out to be longer ago than that. Um, but it was memorable for a number of occasions. It was prosecuted by the then, now I can't remember then if she was Lord Advocate or Solicitor General, but it was Elish Angelini. Alison Dorolo was her junior. Paul McBride was my senior. Um, I think Lord Brackadale was the judge. But it was an extraordinary case. It involved solicitors flying to... Solicitors flying to the to, to Slovakia and all sorts of things. Just an extraordinary, extraordinary case, and and also and and a very, very unpleasant, nasty, evil case. I think 
You know, I, I often, when I go and I, I work with schools in uh, mock trial competitions and things like that, and frequently you're asked, you know, you're asked the obvious question about how do you defend guilty people. But I often explain to people that you frequently sit opposite people in prison thinking, if I had had their start in life, I'm not going to say that I wouldn't be sitting on the other side of the table just now. But you also do meet people who are um, at a different end of the spectrum and people that you would never be and you cannot comprehend. And the accused in that case, I think, fell into that category. He was a very difficult person and, by the jury's verdict, a very, very nasty piece of work. So, yeah. Thanks Thankfully, the real evil folk are fairly few and far between, I suppose. Um, uh, and as many people say on this quiz again, you, you encounter people whose life experiences certainly influence how they end up in a in a dock. But um, you seem to, well, you, you haven't spoken to you previously about your cases and things. You seem to get involved in quite a lot of the ones where you do encounter the, the nasties. Um, you were going to say attract, weren't you? Uh, I, <laughs> <laughs> There's a common theme, Tony, I think. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that comes about because in my early stages at the bar, I was a much better junior than I am just now. So I was a very focused junior, great spreadsheets and electronic capture and summaries and all of that sort of stuff. So I think that tempted people to bring me into very big cases because I could manage the information well. So that brought me into that, that sort of scale of case, some cases with, you know, cases with thousands of witnesses. Um, and very often those cases involve very unusual accused people. Mm. So I've, as of you, I've met all sorts of curiosities. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. Um, question nine, which I suppose is quite similar to <laughs> the question, uh, most inspiring colleague, but this one is who has had the biggest influence on your career in law? Um, I, my answer to that is, I think I'd probably say my dad in that. So my dad was a chartered accountant and had a sort of, soft approach to guiding me in a career. The one thing he was clear about was I shouldn't become a chartered accountant. Right. And I think he impressed upon me that he wished he had done law. And so when he could see that I was a little bit directionless after my first degree, again, very gently pushed me towards that and also allowed me to, you know, to go and do law as a second degree, you have to pay for the degree. Mm. And made him, my mum and dad made the very generous offer of putting me through that. And uh, so, but for that, I would not be here doing what I'm doing now. So I think I say that to him. All right. Okay. That's a nice answer. Um, mm. Question number 10, Tony, is your funniest or most memorable court moment? I've got two. Now, one I was there for, and one I had told to me by the person who was there. Right. So, uh, Ian Duguid's done this already, has he? Uh, yeah, aha. Uh -huh. Did he describe his funniest court moment? Because I don't, I don't want to then... No, um, because the questions have changed since the first quiz, so he did the first one, so I don't... Oh. That was not one of the, the questions, and I don't think he mentioned it in his quiz, thinking back, so go for it. <laughs> he tells a fantastic story of uh, something happening during a trial, single accused trial, and he needed to take urgent instructions in Salt Market. And so the judge said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll rise for 10 minutes, but it needs to be 10 minutes. You need to be back in court. He bounded downstairs, spoke to the man or woman about whatever it was, and then the case is tannoyed mid-discussion. So they finish off what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. The uh, doc escort said to him, do you want to just do you want to just come up through court to save you going all the way around? And Ian said, yeah, that would be great. And so they open the door at the bottom and then he comes back and up the stairs into a completely different trial and has to then, because the door <laughs> at the bottom, 
walk over one security guard and an accused and another security guard and accused and apologize to the jurors who are staring at him. So I, I wish I'd been there for that. Oh my goodness, I've never heard that story. Oh, you've got to ask him about it. It's a very good story. Oh. <laughs> in the Queen's Park case, I was speaking to... So there was a witness in the, in the, uh, the box. Mm -hmm. It was a witness who worked in a, a sort of hostel near the, near the park itself. And I think was perhaps either early to the scene or something like that. Mm. So I'm speaking to Paul McBride at this point. We're, th this witness doesn't impact upon us, but the next witness was very important. So we're going through the various structures of what was to be done. And Lord Brackadale, so obviously the, the Crown finish and sit down, and Lord Brackadale catches um, our attention by saying, well, Mr McBride. And so he gets up and walks across and stares at the witness and said to the witness, how long have you been a uh, Detective Chief Inspector? <laughs> and the witness said, I am not a Detective Chief Inspector. And he said, well, all right, how long have you been in CID? I'm not in CID. How long have you been a policeman? I'm not a policeman. And then he said, who are you? <laughs> and the witness said to say, you know, I'm, I'm Bog McGlumfer. What do you, what do? You do? Now, I honestly think if at that point I was standing in, and, and there, was, there was a lot of press in the court and everything else, mm -hmm. then I would just have had to hand my wig to the clerk and say, I'm genuinely very sorry, I'm going to go back to university or something like that, I can't. <laughs> but the, the, the phrase that young people use is that he styled it out. So having discovered that this guy worked in the, uh, the environment, because the point of the next witness, the senior police officer, was to talk about how complicated and dense with criminality the park was and he just got this chap and did the same thing and th 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 so that was very that was very memorable because it went from being just the most horrific car crash in the making to looking absolutely fine and that, that uh, I, I could picture that i can hear him saying who are you to the witness <laughs> oh dear Oh, um, question 11, uh, talking about mistakes. We all make mistakes. What uh, have you learned from a professional error? Do you know, I learned early on that the, the human being in you wants to tell people comforting things so that they feel better. Mm -hmm. And I had a tendency early on, because there's lots of lawyers who when they think someone's going to get 10 years, they'll say, I think you're going to get 20 so that if they get 10, it looks fantastic. Mm. Um, I had always approached it on the basis that if I thought they were going to get 10, I would say 10. But I think there were times early on when, when someone who was you know, clearly in extremis, you would say, but it might be eight, it might be seven or whatever, and you absolutely make a rod for your own back when you do that. So you're then trying to, so what you think is the absolutely theoretical best result you've already told them that so even to draw even you have to deliver a fantastic result so i learned that the human instinct to calm people down and give them good news doesn't serve you or them well in the long run mm. that is good advice and that is there is a tendency to when you see their face, if you can maybe give them, not, not that it's probably good practice to be giving, handing out numbers because it is a complete unknown, but you're right, you make a rod for your own back and then anything above that, then you have failed um, if, if it comes to that, you know. Right. In the, in right. the right. So I'm better, but I'm still, I, I, I'm still sometimes a bit optimistic when people say, what do, what do you think I'm going to get? So I should maybe move further and become genuinely pessimistic and just make life easier for myself. But in doing that, I don't make life more pleasant for that person. And so I'm sure I'll end up continuing to make life difficult for myself. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, question 12, Tony. What do you do to stay well? Um, I like that. I like being outside and I like making things. So if I can combine the two, then that's a very relaxing 
time. So during lockdown, um, I found lockdown quite difficult. But then I committed to, I built a pond in the garden. And so initially, because I was recovering at that point from a broken shoulder, and it was good exercise, because I had, to, I had to dig out lots of stumps from trees that I had previously cut down. Uh, and I found that just, I find that enormously rewarding. So I like working outside, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I, 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 I do lots of work with trees. I've started making rustic furniture, things like that. If I could picture, I can't splice in a picture because I can hardly reject a phone call without it <laughs> interrupting that. But, uh, so, so that's my new. I've got a thing called an Alaskan mill, which is an attachment to your chainsaw. I assume you have a chainsaw as well. Of course. And chainsaws, what it allows you to do is to cut perfectly flat slabs of wood just from trees that you've cut down. Um, I know you still need to sand them and things like that, but it allows you to make really nice large-scale furniture like benches and tables and things like that. Outdoor furniture or are you... Um... Oh, very much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just... the, 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 the last two I made are both oak benches and because of the, the sort of scale, the, the last one weighed about a quarter of a ton. Right. So it makes it quite complicated because there are very, you have to put it somewhere where you can get a car quite close to it, otherwise you need a forklift. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So is that the project for this lockdown? You've been doing the outdoor furniture? Well, no, this lockdown, I could continue to work largely. So that then just weekends and things like that. Okay. The, the, my, the pond, I've largely finished the pond. Uh, it needs, a, it needs a, a good growing year. So I really finished it and planted it maybe by um, August or September of last year, which means still looks a little bit like a quarry or landfill site. <laughs> but I'm hoping that this year, when it has a full growing season, that will soften it very much. There's a lot of rock involved. I, I, I think worked out something like 20 tonnes of rock eventually went into it. But it, it, so it still looks quite raw. Mm -hmm. um, but a good season's growing will soften that. Uh, so at the moment, working with wood, although I can't really do that stuff because it's too cold. Yeah. Um, but there's, a, there's an oak near where I am. A, a big oak was taken down and then left. So that I could cut it into slabs, and it's part of a. That there's a new library being built in Strathblane, and the hope is that some of the sort of outdoor benches and all of the rest of it can come from this tree because it's a tree that belonged to a, 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 the dominant benefactor of the library. So it'd be quite a pleasant thing if some of that tree can be turned into furniture for that library. But it's paused. I haven't done anything for the last two weeks because it's too cold. Yeah, I, I, almost an exhibition, Tony. You should be. <clears throat> You should be advertising it once you get the, the benches and all the rest of it outside the... It, it's, a, it's a hobbit scale. So <laughs> for inlaid marquetry, it's not like that. It does. It looks exactly like somebody made it with a chainsaw. That's what it looks like. So like, I, I need to get away from myself now. Well, uh, an innovative, uh, at least. I actually saw, I'm just, when you're talking about it, I'm thinking I saw somebody had made garden furniture out of wooden pallets like a chair, oh. and is it that kind of um, rustic feel, or you sound a bit more organic than that? Yeah. Yeah. So it, it, it ends up being very different from that. And it, the, the wood, people use pallet wood because it's a cheap way of getting reasonable quality wood, but it's a soft wood. Mm -hmm. um, and soft wood's not great in outdoor furniture because you, you either have to treat it all the time or it will come apart, and all the fixings will come apart. So if you can if you can do it from hardwood, like oak, uh, or like beech, or something like that, or alder, alder is very good. Alder in a wet climate is a very good wood. Then all the better. But they, but they tend to be very heavy. That's the difficulty. Is your end product then you can rupture yourself trying to move it. <laughs> also, right. the equivalent of asbestosis is from wood dust because the amount of sanding that goes on. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, I've, I've inhaled horrific quantities of that. Because of the beard, I can't wear a, a face mask. That is an effective seal. Yeah. There you go. Okay. I'll send you a picture. Um, and I think you should really launch a website with your furniture. I mean, you could make you could make a bit of money on the side with it. Yeah, well. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Question 13. Um, 
what advice would you give on dealing with challenging clients? Um, I, I think my advice would be you, you, you can't, if, it's easy sometimes to let a client get away with, you know, misquoting something back to you or misremembering something so that that then becomes fact as they see it. So I think being strict with clients so that when they say something which needs to be challenged, then do challenge it. Because if you let it go unchallenged, then you're stuck with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think, going back to what I said earlier on, just being absolutely straight and not telling people things to cheer them up. If someone's in a lot of trouble, telling them they're in a lot of trouble. If someone's in a position where a trial offer, offers no benefit, I think I'm quite good at that, is saying to them, a trial's not the way forward for you here on paper, at least. Um, so keeping charge of the accused to that extent so that they know that you are there to take decisions and you will take decisions and when you sit, tell them something, they need to listen to it because you're telling the truth. Mm 